Thank you. So, um, unfortunately, Chairman um, Johnston had a family emergency this morning and has had to return um, home. So I will be chairing this meeting today, so bear with me. <laughs> it's my first time. Um, so, calling the meeting to order, um, Ch Commissioner Cavilia, will you lead us in the pledge? Brandy, can you call the roll, please? Chairman Johnson. Vice Chairman East. Here. Commissioner Almberg. Here. Commissioner Barnes. Here. Commissioner Cavilia. Here. Commissioner Hubbs. Here. Commissioner Keel. Here. Commissioner McNinch. Here. Commissioner Valentine. And Commissioner Valentine um, had an excused absence. He has a prior family commitment today. Um, will the members of the county advisory boards please introduce themselves? Thank you. Okay, approval of the agenda. Um, Vice Chairman East for possible action. The Commission will review the agenda and may take action to approve the agenda. The Commission may remove items from the agenda, continue items for consideration, or take items out of order. I don't believe we have any reason to change the agenda today, so, um, so we don't need to do anything, right, Craig? Right? Okay, just move on to the next one. Member and I items and announcements and correspondence. Um, Commissioners may present emergent items. No action may be taken by the commission. Any item requiring commission action may be scheduled on a future commission agenda. The commission will review and may discuss correspondence sent or received by the commission since the last regular meeting and may provide copies for the exhibit file. Commissioners may provide hard copies of their correspondence for the written record. Correspondence sent or received by Secretary Wasley may also be discussed. Um, so I have one item. Um, there's a coalition of conservationists, wildlife um, enthusiasts, and wild horse activists that have come together to um, develop and put on a forum, and it's called Horse Rich and Dirt Poor, the challenge to healthy Nevada lands, wildlife, and wild horses. Um, it'll take place in Reno on Wednesday, October 23rd from 5.30 to 8 at the Nevada Museum of Art in the Sky Room. There's a panel um, that represents a wide uh, array of conservationists. Um, and the, mo it'll be moderated by Jeremy Drew, who's the former chairman of this body. Um, the panelists include Steve Foray, with a, uh, retired from the Nevada Department of Wildlife, Dr. Jim Sedinger, a retired University of Nevada Reno professor, uh, population ecologist, Celeste Carlisle, return to freedom, science advisor, Alan Shepard from the Bureau of Land Management, the National Wild Horse and Burrow on Range Program Lead, Tina Nappi, um, she's a longtime um, conservationist, Greg Hendricks with the American Wild Horse Campaign, and Dr. J.J. Goikachia. So um, there, there is a flyer and there's a Facebook page that's gotten started. If you're interested, um, I'm happy to share more information. And that was all I had. Director Wasley, do you have anything? No? Will the County Advisory Boards to Manage Wildlife member items, informational. Um, CAB members may present emergent items. No action may be taken by the Commission. Any item requiring Commission action will be scheduled on a future Commission agenda. Do we have anybody? Gil. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representing Carson City, at the last meeting, there was a tremendous amount of interest with regards to what's happening at the NAS, the Naval Air Station, and what's going to happen in the future. And they were concerned about trying to get ahead of the issue with maybe we should be looking at 
some herd management issues and maybe moving some of the game out of the harm's way that may occur. And I, I was impressed with uh, Mr. Janae's re report yesterday, and I'll make sure we get a copy and, and go over that for the public at the, our next meeting uh, because people are concerned. That's, those are some prime game areas that the people, you know, really vie for, and we'd hate to see something like that happen to the herd that's in there. And hopefully in the long run, we can make some plans to relocate the game if, if necessary as they make decisions about what they're gonna do with the area. So thank you very much. Thank you, Gil. And my apologies, I believe we have Reno online. Yes, thank you, Chairman East. Um, we have one uh, county cab, Washoe Cal Cab, Steve Robinson. Thank you. Um, do you have a comment? Any comment? No comments, though. Okay, thank you. Thank you. If we don't have any other um, county advisory board member items, we'll move into reports informational. Um, Conservation Partner Profile, Secretary Wasley, informational. An overview of a key conservation partner program will be shared with the commission. Thank you, Vice Chair East. <clears throat> so you know probably better than anybody the genesis of this reoccurring agenda item. Um, it was your interest originally to learn a little bit about some of our conservation partners. Uh, so as we as we move around the state and have opportunity to, to bring various groups in and hear from them what they do, uh, what their interests, passions, priorities are, uh, we're going to take advantage of that opportunity. So today we have Meadow Valley Wildlife Unlimited and, and Corey Lytles here. I, I believe uh, many of you have this little trifold document and uh, Corey's gonna, gonna share with us uh, a little background and uh, history on Meadow Valley Wildlife Unlimited. Uh, thank you, Director Wasley. Uh, we, we tried to keep this thing pretty simple. So we, d we just put some brochures together. There's, there's a few more right here on these armrests if anybody else didn't get any from the front or if you even want one. Uh, real quickly, I don't, I don't wanna take up everybody's time. Uh, we, uh, as, as Director Wassily mentioned, we, we Meadow Valley Wildlife Unlimited, we're based in Lincoln County right there, kind of in that Meadow Valley area. And it, it's kind of a combination of the small communities that are in that area. We, we don't have a specific, it's just, it's just one community in, in and of itself. And so that's kind of the, you know, the basis of the name. Uh, we, we kind of started things off, kind of a handful of us back in like 07. Uh, we, we originally rolled under as a chapter of the Mule Deer Foundation, and uh, we kind of went, went through that pathway for a few years. And, and as we got better at what we were doing and kind of better with figuring out the whole process, uh, we decided, you know, it would be best uh, for our local interests especially. And through some uh, recommendations from some of our neighbors down here and some of the guys that were on the cabs and in the commission, we rolled into our own thing and created our own uh, 501c3 in, in 2014. Then the primary reason behind that is just the idea that there's, there's nothing wrong with these national and large organizations and these big conservation groups, but the problem we were seeing is we could put more money, local money, uh, money that was made at our uh, fundraisers and stuff right there on the ground, right there personally where everybody could see it and, and we, could, we could streamline things and, and do things in a little cleaner manner. Uh, just, just real quick, um, Nevada Nonprofit Corporation, we've got a nine member uh, board of directors. Our primary mission is to conserve wildlife habitat and the hunting heritage, uh, real generic, real simple. And we really only do about one fundraiser a year. We, we try not to get too carried away with that type of thing. We do an annual banquet. Um, you guys have seen the amenities up there, you know, kind of what we're dealing with. We, we actually stuff five, 600 people in that little Cal Annie volunteer fire station. So we roll the trucks out and we roll a bunch of people in there. And thank goodness we're in a fire station because if there was a fire, we just open the doors and turn the water on. So I, it's, it's, it's kind of fun in a way. It's, it's very hectic. It's elbow to elbow for a few hours and it's organized chaos, but, but, but that's what we do. Uh, we, uh, we 
feed everybody. The guys roll out the grills. They roll out the Dutch ovens. There are a pile of ribeye steaks that go on the grill. I mean, it's it's a big, it's basically a big barbecue and a big family family fundraiser. Uh, we sure we sure lean on a lot of folks from down in this area. We get we get probably between a third and a half to our uh, people at the banquet from Southern Nevada, from the Las Vegas area, and and I know I know a lot of these guys have come up. Um, we appreciate all their help at Woods and Waters for the fraternity. With everything we do, we partner in with those guys on a lot of things, and we we certainly appreciate that that help. Um, in those smaller areas, it is it is a challenge. It is a challenge to get everybody involved. Um, you guys are well aware, and in, in a lot of those areas, uh, you wear many hats. I, I've got members on my board that are that are fire chiefs, volunteer fire chiefs. They're uh, this or that, so they're wearing several hats. So it's it's kind of a it's kind of a neat thing in a way when you can pull that many people in, and they're 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 organized in other means and manners through other things in the community. They're they're really dug into the community and a part of the community, so it really helps kind of garner that family atmosphere. Um, anyway, our our objectives. Uh, I'll go through these really quickly. You'll have them in your brochure in, in a kind of simplistic format. Support the scientific management of wildlife and habitat. Uh, want to inform and educate the public concerning true conservation of wildlife and its habitat. Really want to focus on the science side of it. Um, we want to protect, defend, and preserve the lawful right and privilege to pursue hunting, fishing, and trapping as it relates to good wildlife management. We want to encourage true and responsible conservation as it relates to those things, just to kind of emphasize that point. Uh, we want to promote coordinated efforts to improve and conserve wildlife and their habitat and just get some funding to help do that. There's always a funding mechanism. We always have to have a funding mechanism for what we do. Everyone's, everyone's very familiar with that type of thing. You know, the, the objectives and they relate to the bigger picture, kind of some of the things you'll see in the brochure. Uh, we, uh, we parallel a lot of the other organizations. You guys have seen a lot of the organizations come up, give presentations. It, it's a true parallel. Um, you've got to develop those relationships. Uh, we've got some really good relationships with our federal, state, and, and other local partners. I'm lucky enough, our, our president is actually our local BLM fire ecologist, and I hope he never retires. But an example, a small example of that is I have, I have a very easy stream and a very easy line of communication between his goals and, and the things he has to do through the Bureau of Land Management in our, in our local BLM district and the, and the process that we go through to try to get money for projects. The identification of stuff, uh, you know, the NEPA work, things like that. And he, he serves as our president. And it's, it's a fantastic relationship that we have and, and we're able to do those types of things. Um, the relationship we have with other NGOs, I mentioned Woods and Waters, I mentioned the fraternity, all, all these guys are just fantastic. It, they're such a passion that, that uh, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty remarkable when you get, you get everybody involved and you can really, really do some beneficial things. Uh, as far as the pro projects go, lately we've been focused on a lot of the PJ treatment in that area, primarily related to the sage grass issue and, and related to, uh, you know, some of the sagebrush uh, ecosystem type uh, restoration. Uh, you'll see pictures in the brochure of some of those projects. Uh, the one on the one fold out is right there, right there across from where you guys were in August uh, at Cave Valley Ranch. That Haggerty chaining sits right out across the, uh, the valley from that. That's a, that's a prime example of a, of a primary treatment that was done, you know, 15 or 20 years ago as a chaining and the new, the new younger uh, PJ have sprouted up, and what we like to do is go in, in a lot of those areas and take those PJ out. As long as those, those younger, uh, more desirable, you know, uh, species of vegetation are coming up, we like to foster that and keep that going. So it's, it's more of a maintenance project than it is a true, you know, uh, start from scratch project, and we really like to do that because the, uh, the money stretches a long way. Um, that's one example. Uh, we like to work on the riparian areas, uh, both private and public. Uh, we, we always dance that dance with what's private, privately held and publicly held. Luckily, I know a lot of people that have a little bit of private property up in that area and, and we're able to kind of help in and pony in, especially in soft, soft match or labor and 
material, not necessarily just uh, straight funding. Uh, water developments, of course, guzzlers are a constant uh, between maintenance, uh, rebuilds, things like that. Um, we were giggling earlier that the front page has a has a picture of some guys standing around in a team meeting and a lot of the, the old guzzlers that were the apron guzzlers, there was always a, a little bit of a, a challenge getting those Johnson screens level and getting all the water to run right where it was. And that was kind of the joke on that on that picture was trying to get those Johnson screens lined up. Um, Mike Scott's wearing the white t-shirt, by the way. Uh, you know, of course, there's the funding side of it. We, you, you're always focused on getting that funding, keep the funding going. And then what we really try to focus on is the education side of things and the promotional, uh, the promotional sponsorships, whether it's Shooting Sports Foundation or whether it's uh, Youth 4-H. That's, a, that's growing uh, in leaps and bounds throughout the state. So great programs. Um, kids love it. And, and those are the types of things that we really are you know, are kind of focused on currently. Uh, kind of branching off from that real quickly, the, the habitat conservation side of things, we really focus on, you know, the long-term sustainability of, of what we're doing and the things that are, that are not only two years out, five years out, but 20 and 30 years out. So we try to look at some of these projects from a, from a 10,000 foot perspective uh, I mentioned our president that's, that's a fire ecologist. Um, you guys may or may not be familiar with the, kind of how the process works up there. We're primarily uh, public land, BLM managed land, and they work through watershed planning and, and different watershed type deals and try to get the NEPA clearance on certain areas. And, and to have all that in place and to look at a long-term you know, watershed plan as it relates to what you want to do, it, it gives you a really good picture on, on the overall the overall side of things and, and where you want to do your projects, where you want to maybe place a guzzler, where you want to do a specific type of vegetation treatment. So, so that's really important. Um, again, the partnerships, trying to get everybody involved and trying to get uh, some buy-in on some of these is, is critical. The youth, the youth is a huge thing. We, lo we love having the kids. We love having the kids at the banquets. Uh, we love giving away stuff to the kids. We like lining the kids up and throwing all kinds of stuff at them. Um, you know, the, the one brochure, the one uh, side of the brochure has, has a few kids there on it. And that middle picture, it's pretty hard to get a 16-year-old girl to sit in a blind with face paint on. And just, just to be able to do that with that age of kids and to kind of make them understand and realize what's going on and, 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 and what their goal is and what their, what their place is in terms of management is a neat thing. Uh, we, we don't get enough of that out there. We don't get enough of the true message out there. So we really try to focus on the, the stewardship side of that and the ownership side of that and, and try, to, try to foster that along. And it's, it's not easy. You, you guys know, everybody in here knows how, how difficult that is. They've, they've got a lot of distractions. Some of them are good distractions, whether it's football or whatever it is, but it, it's neat to at least introduce it to them, and you just got to keep pounding it into them because that's our future. Uh, our wildlife won't be anywhere if we don't have that, you know, coming in the next generation. So we kind of want to foster the next generation. Uh, real quick, I'll dive into how important wildlife management and, and, and the wildlife aspect is to some of our smaller economies. Um, we, we don't see that down in areas like this as much, but uh, those smaller towns really benefit from hunting and really benefit from true and, 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 and the, the side of uh, improving hunts, uh, offering more hunter opportunity, offering a few more of the, the variable hunts. Um, you, you can't believe what small businesses will do uh, they, they talk to me all the time about it, like in Pioche or in, in Panac or Caliani, motels, gas stations, things like that. When you can trickle a series of, of hunt seasons through a, through a fall, it carries a lot of those businesses through wintertime. Um, it's, it's very important. And, and I understand it's not a huge part of, uh, you know, an overall state economy or anything, but it's just one small benefit and bonus that I want this board and this body in here to realize is, is how important wildlife are to, to, to those small economies. Um, and then there's just the culture and heritage of things. Uh, I mentioned the kids and the next generation. Uh, we, 
we, we have a culture. It's a cherished culture. It's, it's very close, near and dear to my heart. Uh, I know there's, there's oftentimes some, some volatile issues that come up in here, whether it, whether it be uh, trapping or whether it be lion hunting or whether it be coyotes, uh, things like that that really, you, you know, people are very passionate and very, uh, very vocal in some points, very, very emotional in a lot of, on a lot of levels. We, everyone has a culture. And they have a heritage that they want to foster and 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 keep whole, and and continue into the, into the future. And that's just one of the things that we really try to foster. Um, we we want to we want it to stay. It, it's a it's a piece. It's a piece of us. It's a piece of our heritage, um, and it's it's something we don't want to lose. So you know that's very important. Uh, other than that. I'm, I don't want to bore anybody. I don't want to put anybody to sleep. So I'm happy to take any questions or, or, or leave it at that. Thank you, Corey. These you are really important for me to hear of all the efforts that are going on throughout the state. So I appreciate it. Good. Does anybody have any questions for Corey? Chairman or Commissioner Hubs? Just in regard to Meadow Valley, um, do we have two Meadow Valleys or more than one Meadow Valley? I know Meadow Valley, or maybe I'm thinking of Moapa Valley. Or is there a Meadow Valley Wash there and one in Lincoln? That's, that's just... the Meadow Valley Wash. It, it, it actually starts in Lincoln County. It heads in Lincoln County in Little Spring Valley, and it, it actually drains clear down into the Muddy River. So okay. it, it yeah. kind of, yeah, it, it goes a ways. It's, yeah, so I, that's the only one I know of over yeah. here. I don't know about anywhere else Tony might. Corey, it's just good to hear all the good stuff you're doing. But I really like to hear what you're serving at your dinner. Thanks. Oh, I, I didn't hear that. Sorry. What'd you say? I said I really like to hear what you're serving at your dinner. So thank you. Ribeye. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. We we do have chicken, but I always have in parentheses if you you're like chicken. <laughs> when is your dinner, Corey? When is your dinner? Uh, unfortunately, it's usually the week of your March meeting down here. It's March 21st, 2020. So March if anybody 21st. wants to ditch the, I'll give you an excuse if you want to ditch the meeting and come to Cali and maybe win something. Hey, every year I drive, catch this meeting and drive up there and catch up. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Moving on to Department Activity Report, Secretary Tony Wasley. D Director Wasley will report provide a report on recent department activities. Thank you, Vice Chairman, uh, Chairwoman. I've already had, I think, at least three inquiries as to the length of this uh, report today. <clears throat> so I'm a little gun shy. But I know we have plenty of time because we have such a light agenda. So uh, there's some really exciting things going on in the department. I'll try to just hit some of the, the highlights. Uh, we talked a little bit yesterday about some of the efforts around Fallon Naval Air Station. Uh, I did uh, attend a stakeholder meeting along with other department staff. Senator Cortez Masto has encouraged the state to co-produce a unified position and present a document with all stakeholder stances kind of wrapped up into one. The department participated in this uh, preparation and a unified document has since been presented to be included, uh, possibly included in the National Defense Authorization Act. Since the last commission meeting, um, I've had communications regarding a host of uh, resource topics with Congresswoman Titus, uh, Congressman Horsford's staff, Congressman Amade, uh, and Senator Cortez Masto. Uh, I, I don't recall a time um, in my approximately 20 plus years where we've had the level of interest uh, from both our congressional delegation, our, our state legislators, the engagement with the governor's office, um, there is a strong uh, and encouraging interest in conservation and wildlife. Some of it's around um, certainly the military expansion, some of it's around horses and burrows, some of it's around fire and invasives. There's a lot of big uh, emerging issues, ongoing issues, and to have the level of interest uh, by all those parties is, is encouraging. Um, also, I had a, had a meeting with the uh, University of Nevada, Reno uh, provost and uh, executive vice president, um, Kevin Carman, along with the dean 
of the College of Agriculture, Biotechnology, and Natural Resources, just to highlight the significance of the relationship between the department and the university and to discuss shared business goals and other uh, opportunities in the future. Also wanted to report that uh, Recovering America's Wildlife Act uh, currently has, uh, at last report, 118 co-sponsors. Uh, that's the that's, uh, House resolution. It would provide 1.4 billion uh, dedicated funding to state and tribal fish and wildlife agencies for conservation and monitoring of at-risk species. Several sign-on letters have been developed to build support with the business and industry community, as well as the science and research communities. House Natural Resource Committee members are being asked to co-sponsor the bill, and it's likely that the bill will have a committee hearing in the next few months. The department is uh, co-hosting a Recovering America's Wildlife Act panel at the upcoming Joint Wildlife Society and American Fisheries Society uh, annual conference, and I'll provide a little update on that conference uh, a few, few items from now. Uh, the goal of the panel discussion will be to raise awareness of the legislation as well as uh, kind of present a call to action. So we're also developing some ads, some infographics, and other supporting documentation to build local awareness and support. Uh, the department is still accepting applications for the position of chief game warden. Uh, we hope to have this position filled in, in the near future. And also in the, the personnel arena, um, I was remiss in not introducing our, our new uh, division administrator for data and technology services. That was a position that was previously held by Chet Van Dellen. And so the department uh, recently hired Kim Munoz, who's here today, Kim. And we were super lucky to uh, lure her away um, from the Department of Transportation. She brings an uh, incredible skill set um, in, in areas where uh, the department is going to benefit greatly. So we're, we're super excited, feel really fortunate to have been able to steal her away from, from the Department of Transportation. Uh, so apologies to uh, Kim for not making that announcement yesterday when we had a few more people in attendance. In the game division, uh, the game division has requested input from the CABs on the waterfowl zone split designations. The department intends to use the information and the recommendations at the March 2020 meeting. Uh, federal frameworks will be amended only once every five years, and the next waterfowl zone split will influence waterfowl, waterfowl seasons from 2021 to 2025. The Game and Habitat Divisions participated in a workshop on migration corridors that was hosted by the Ruckles House Institute uh, with the University of Wyoming. Staff Specialist Cody Schroeder provided a presentation on the state of the science in Nevada. It was a day-long workshop and it encouraged communication among the de department and various wildlife conservation organizations. The department continues to work with the Department of Transportation to develop a wildlife coordination workshop for county and municipal planners. Migration corridor workshops have identified the need to share information on wildlife with other planners. Currently, the department works well with NDOT and federal highways to incorporate movement considerations for wildlife, including tortoises, bighorn sheep, mule deer, among others, but our ability to coordinate with development planners seems less effective. The workshop is designed to engage county and municipal planners to identify the types of information the department can provide such as factors that influence permeability and avoiding uh, unwanted attractants. The department hopes to learn how to effectively interface in the appropriate planning time frame to enhance our coordination. The department is planning to maintain our enhanced chronic wasting disease surveillance activities for the upcoming fall. Um, I'm, I'm sure you'll, you'll see some of those efforts uh, between signage and uh, check stations, but Check stations and uh, sample collection planning is well underway. Information has been sent to 1,427 Nevada residents that have drawn deer, elk, or moose tags in Utah, Montana, and Wyoming uh, on the updated regulations on importing harvested animals from other states. We worked with those states to obtain lists of Nevada residents that would be that had tags in those states. Uh, so that we could notify those, proactively notify those individuals before they would potentially be bringing infected material back into Nevada. Colorado has regulations that preclude the ability to disclose information on their hunters 
Arizona and Idaho continue to seek the ability to inform Nevada hunters with tags in their state. So rather than, than us uh, sending to Nevada residents who have tags uh, like we are in uh, Utah, Montana, Wyoming, Arizona, and Idaho would notify their tag holders who identify as Nevada residents of Nevada's. Uh, so we're, we're using different, different strategies, but uh, trying to inform anybody who might be hunting those species in other states before they come back to Nevada. The game division is actively updating the hunter information sheets that are posted on our website to provide hunters with timely information on species distribution and access in individual units. <clears throat> the game division has been planning for upcoming pronghorn captures this fall. We have capture locations identified and radio callers ready for deployment and are tentatively planning to begin captures on September 24th. These captures will deploy radio callers associated with funding from uh, the Migration Corridor and Seasonal Range Secretarial Order 3362 uh, from last fiscal year. <clears throat> the department has prepared and submitted additional research projects associated with movement corridors for FY 2020 as well. The Habitat Division, while it's been a rather light wildfire season, there have been a few important fires, including the Cherry and Corda fires in the Ruby Mountains that the department will focus on seeding this fall. The fall 2019 rehab actions will also be reseeding chemically fallowed treatments from the 2018 wildfire season. Other habitat treatments include uh, recent treatment of approximately 3,000 acres of conifer removal near Overland Pass in the Rubies and an additional 4,000 acres of removal underway in Baldwin Canyon on, on Mount Grant. So the chemical following a relatively new technique post fire when you have a fire season like we have the last two years when you get a million acres that burn um, each of those two years there's no way that, that you can get to uh, all of that and <clears throat> the best case scenario the hope is uh, if we can capture these sites prevent them from from being um, quickly recolonized by cheatgrass or or other non-desirables that you extend the window of time with which you can get in and, and treat them. <clears throat> you hope that you'll have um, a smaller fire season in a subsequent year that'll free up those resources to go back and then re-veg in those chemically fallowed areas. So fortunately, knock on wood, uh, thus far, although we've had some significant fires as, as Commissioner Barnes can attest to, um, we do have uh, overall fewer acres and have an opportunity to go back and re-veg some of those areas that have been chemically followed. Technical review program has been actively providing input relative to actions proposed for public lands. Recently, we've been involved in multiple proactive projects that have the potential to improve habitat conditions for wildlife. These projects include uh, the BLM riparian protection and enhancement programmatic environmental assessment, which will provide programmatic coverage for the management actions in riparian habitat within the Winnemucca District Office, providing wildlife recommendations for development of a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service candidate conservation agreement with assurances, known as a CCAA for private lands in Northern Nevada, and input into the programmatic environmental impact statement for fuel breaks across the Great Basin regions. So the programmatic approach, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a larger scale approach that can be applied either to the state, but some, some jurisdictional boundary in these instances, some of them are, are within BLM districts, but the programmatic approach, you don't go in and, and take an individual chunk of land and have a footprint. Uh, the footprint is, is the entire district or the entire state. So it's a much more efficient, much more effective way to deal with some of these NEPA analyses. So instead of doing a NEPA analysis for this 40 acres and this 120 acres and this 2,000 acres, it's a programmatic level uh, that applies to the entire district. At their August 14th, 2019 meeting, the White Pine County Commission voted to support the no action alternative regarding the White Pine County Silver State Trail EA, and the BLM has again placed the Silver State Trail project on hold. In the Conservation Education Division, um, the department and the Nevada Department Department of Transportation were nationally recognized with the 2019 Environmental Excellence Award from the Federal Highway Administration uh, to, for installing nine wildlife safety crossings in northeastern Nevada. 
promotion of the award included multiple social media days, a new segment on KOLO Channel 8 in Reno, and a Nevada Wild podcast. Uh, there was an, a really impressive 14-minute uh, video that was assembled that really highlighted those efforts. Um, with the uh, permission of the commission, I'd like to perhaps show that to the commission and, and members in attendance at uh, our next commission meeting. I'll add that to the list. We'll certainly work work with the chair and um, with with his approval. We'll add that to the to the list. Um, we can share that link out as well. Making a note to remember that. Also from the conservation education division, as as mentioned earlier, <clears throat> staff developed Recovering America Wild Recovering America's Wildlife Act ads for the Reno Tahoe magazine. The ads can be found um, throughout the 2020 year and are designed following the Making It Last toolkit, which is a national conservation outreach strategy strategy designed by the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies to significantly increase awareness. Um, of its role in protecting and conserving wildlife among target audiences. So the, the Making It Last Toolkit is, uh, as, as I said, a, a national conservation outreach strategy was developed uh, by private uh, interests and expertise. It was tested in focus groups for its residents. Um, there's four ads that were used, were developed using that toolkit. Um, and so you, you may see some of those. Uh, there, there's um, tortoise, uh, golden eagle, um, a mule deer, I can't remember the, the fourth one, uh, but you, you may see those. Um, combination of Recovering America's Wildlife and the Making It Last uh, campaign combines to kind of uh, take these compelling images of Nevada species and some interesting informational facts and has the, the hashtag uh, Recovering Wildlife. Staff <clears throat> worked with multiple agencies, including the U.S. Forest Service, California State Parks, California Fish and Wildlife, Nevada State Parks, and the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency to launch a website dedicated to providing the public with tips on living, visiting, and playing in bear country, including a tool that allows people to report bear sightings. The website, which is tahoebears.org, um, the launch was picked up by multiple news stations. The meeting was held with the Conservation Education Division staff and the Backcountry Hunters and Anglers Coordinator for California and Nevada. Uh, future events and partnerships were discussed, such as expanding wild game cooking classes, a public landowner film festival, mentoring courses, hands-on courses, integrating wild harvest uh, into our outreach efforts, volunteering on upcoming department projects, and more. Staff also worked on developing an agency presence on a social network called Nextdoor. This is a community-based platform that would allow the department's urban wildlife coordinator and public information officers to inform and educate residents in specific areas when public safety could be at risk, as well as inform the department of ongoing incidents or concerns that residents are experiencing with wildlife. This may turn out to be a great method of communicating with our constituents on a more personalized level. Conservation education staff has started piloting <clears throat> a new program in classrooms this fall called Know Your Nevada. The program is for fourth grade classrooms and consists of three lessons, all focusing on different aspects of our living state symbols, where they're found in Nevada, their adaptations, uh, and what conservation challenges these animals face and what's being done to combat those challenges. For this fall, we have over 50 classrooms participating and have a waiting list as well. Initial feedback from teachers on the program has been very positive. The program will be evaluated during the pilot year and improved upon for the next year. And so in past reports, um, I've, I've reported certain conservation education staff uh, received scholarships to attend uh, education classes at Cornell uh, Ornithological Lab on, on doing outreach. And, and so as we get exposed and, and trained and more and more um, education and, and outreach efforts, trying to build those into some Nevada-specific curriculum and try to get those uh, present in, in the classrooms. Another uh, example of that, uh, Con Ed staff is implementing another year of a successful pilot of a, a distance learning program called Nevada Knockout. 
program is for all grade levels and highlights wildlife that live in Nevada. This year, a website was created specifically for educators to access all materials needed for the program. Last year, several hundred students participated in this program. This year, there are over 3,000 students participating. In the diversity division, uh, fall shorebird surveys were conducted by the Fallon biologists in the Lahontan Valley Wetland, uh, Lahontan Valley during the last week of August, where nearly 16,000 birds were counted. This is above the 10-year average of approximately 13, uh, 13,600. The number of long-billed dowagers was particularly high, almost double the 10-year average. The greatest concentration of shorebirds were found in the big water unit at Carson Lake, despite relatively low acres of surface water that was available in that area. In August, Wildlife Diversity hosted a one-day training session in the Ruby Mountains to teach people how to accurately look for and find pika. Um, pika are small uh, mammal in the uh, rodent family closely related to uh, rabbits, um, live in uh, talus slopes and, and mostly in alpine areas, but also in some, some lower elevation areas. Biologists from both the department and the BLM attended. In late August, the Desatoya mountain range was surveyed in historic areas of pika occupancy. Occupied sites were found along the crest of the Desatoyas north of Desatoya Peak. Other potential habitat patches were observed but not surveyed due to time constraints. Lower elevation areas uh, along Copia Creek and Long Canyon had one potential site, but otherwise was unoccupied. This area needs to be surveyed much more thoroughly in the future, but in general, it seems that higher elevations are more suitable for pika than the lower elevations in, in this mountain range. Several biologists participated in a multi-agency bat survey at Great Basin National Park. In addition to surveying, staff also participated in a week-long training on analyzing bat acoustic data. Uh, it's really the, the bat call, the acoustic data that allows biologists to identify species. Um, it's not within the human range of hearing, but there are, are devices that will create uh, a sonogram and then that sonogram is specific to, to species. Um, bats can be very challenging to catch, and sometimes a better understanding of bat use of an area can be found by recording their foraging vocalizations. In the fisheries division, several northern Nevada waters exhibited hazardous algae blooms, uh, also known as HABs, this summer, including Washoe Lake, Knot Creek, Onion, and Squaw Creek Reservoirs. <clears throat> Only the Squaw Creek uh, HAB was persistent and serious enough to require posting of hazardous conditions by the Nevada Department of Environmental Protection and was still active in early September, but even mild blooms can be a health risk for pets in the water. Fisheries biologists in the eastern region have completed two major restoration projects for recovery of threatened Lahontan cutthroat trout in late August. Approximately 37 miles of the North Fork and Humboldt River and tributaries were treated to remove non-native brook trout and rainbow trout, restoring significant areas of LCT habitat. This was a difficult project because of the large number of beaver dams that hold non-native trout and slow water flows. Over 60 staff from across the department, divisions, and other partner agencies assisted in the treatment. Staff also completed a treatment of Brown Creek in the South Fork of the Humboldt River Basin in August, restoring additional Lahontan cutthroat trout, trout habitat there. Eastern Region staff completed a fish salvage below South Fork Dam in conjunction with repair work to the dam outlet tubes in August. Over 1,000 pounds of channel catfish, wipers, and smallmouth bass were captured and returned to the reservoir. Two high mountain lakes in the Rubies, Lamoille and Hidden, <clears throat> will be stocked with small Lahontan cutthroat trout this fall using pack stock. These waters are only stocked occasionally because of the difficult access. Western Region staff are continuing to work on improvements to the Marlette Lake spawning station near Lake Tahoe, <clears throat> including replacement of the culvert, allowing access from the lake to the station by uh, Tahoe rainbow trout and LCT broodstock. Staff is also working with the Fish and Wildlife Service to stock approximately 2,000 tagged Lahontan cutthroat trout into Lake Tahoe as part of the department's ongoing Lake Tahoe tributary study. The study will help evaluate the use of the tributary streams and inform future recovery of LCT in the Lake Tahoe Basin. 
a project to improve fisheries habitat in North Pond and Bass Pond on Mason Valley Wildlife Management Area is in progress, should be completed this fall. It's focused on control and reduction of emergent vegetation to improve angler access and habitat quality for warm water fish species. Uh, as previously mentioned, the American Fisheries Society and the Wildlife Society will be holding their first ever joint national meeting in Reno at the end of September with the expected attendance of over 5,000 biologists and other wildlife professionals. Several staff from the Fisheries Division as well as other divisions will be giving presentations on department activities at the conference. Reports from the public were received last week about a fish kill of striped bass in the Colorado River near Laughlin. The exact cause is unknown and an investigation is ongoing, but it could be related to sudden changes in discharge water quality below Davis Dam. Data and Technology Services, we are pleased to announce the new Data and Technology Services Division Administrator has started uh, and is continuing to work with CalCAMI on ongoing uh, improvements and evolution as, as the department indicated. Uh, it was kind of an all hands on deck to get that system up and going in year one, the data migration piece. Uh, we kind of built the skeleton and uh, now we're, we're putting um, a lot of the bells and whistles and, and uh, refining it. So we, we look forward to uh, her future reports on improvements um, in, that, in that system and in the DATS division in general. From the law enforcement division, uh, low security conservation prison camp near Peotes had an uprising injuring three corrections officers in the process. A southern region warden assisted Lincoln County with perimeter security while the situation was taken back under control. Game wardens recovered a body and assisted the National Park Service in the investigation of a presumed suicide subject at Lake Mead. Game wardens also assisted in a drowning case at Placer Cove on Lake Mojave. Eastern Region game wardens are currently in the process of pleading and disposing of four major poaching cases from 2016 to 2018. Eastern Region game wardens have also conducted two alpine patrols in the Ruby Mountains in the last two weeks to check backcountry hunters. Richard Doherty was arrested in August in Texas. Uh, he was charged in Elko County for a violation of killing and possession of a mule deer without a tag. The antlers will be sent to Nevada for the Operation Game Thief trailer pending the outcome of the case. It is alleged that he shot a large 4x4 mule deer in Unit 075. Uh, another poaching case is currently being handled by the Elko County District Attorney's Office. Poacher was charged for killing and possessing a trophy class uh, 4x4 mule deer in Area 081 without a permit. The subject allegedly covered it with an Idaho tag and transported it back to Idaho. Game Warden Command staff have participated in meetings with the DA's office in two northern Nevada counties concerning Senate Bill 316 and the implications for the enforcement and how it affects the current trespass law. Uh, the SB 316 was uh, the uh, bill that makes it unlawful for a private landowner to block access to public land. So even if the easement crossed uh, private land, if it was an established easement to get to public land, um, that generally speaking makes it unlawful for those private landowners to block access to that public land. Um, the department, as, as the report indicates, is, uh, is communicating with the district attorney's office around the state because ultimately as a, as a trespass issue, there'll be a high level of variability in how each, each county deals with that. Uh, game wardens have been communicating with several sportsmen and landowners to prevent conflicts on the new law. We're currently uh, completing more research on what roads would be affected, and this will be an ongoing process through the hunting season. Uh, BLM has reached out and offered to help put together several maps to answer questions in the field. Game wardens participated in an Operation Game Thief unit watch near Midas uh, late August and conducted a saturation patrol from September 23rd to the 25th. The staff game warden and reserve game wardens uh, were also on hand. Department purchased uh, 20 state line markers, which will be used to replace some markers on the Idaho, Nevada, and Utah, Nevada borders. They were placed in coordination with a state line uh, patrol where Idaho and Utah open their archery seasons. 
Uh, these were placed while eight more were purchased to complete the major state line crossings at the Idaho border in Unit 081. Ely Game Wardens helped with a search and rescue effort in which a deceased subject was found in his camping trailer after nine days without communication. Uh, the man was 70 years of age. His dog was saved and, and returned to relatives. Game Wardens have assisted in four backcountry UTV accidents where two persons had injuries. An investigation was started on a party of hunters that allegedly cut a rancher's fence and was hunting on his property. The rancher confronted an individual to collect his information. The individual had allegedly made some incriminating statements to the rancher about hunting on private property without permission. The investigation is ongoing. Southern Region Game Warden assisted Lincoln County Sheriff's Office with a narcotics arrest that seized 57 grams of meth, one gram of heroin, and a few Xanax. An OUI checkpoint was held at Cottonwood Cove on August 3rd that resulted in 28 citations and one arrest which required a blood draw warrant for the subject. Southern Region Game Wardens investigated two different sites for reports of dead deer on Mount Charleston. It was determined that each was a mountain lion kill. A deer was also found dead that was determined to be a poaching incident which has an ongoing investigation. And that, Madam Vice Chairman, concludes the department activity report today. Great stuff happening. Any questions for Director Walker? Commissioner Hubbs? Secretary Wellesley, we talked about a little bit about, I think, some riparian bird surveys. One of the things I was reading this past week was um, some art, in some articles, I think it was in the BBC and Time, about a decrease in overall abundance of birds. And I have never, since I've been on the commission, seen the status of regular, regu just regular, um, not even migratory birds, but just even birds that do not migrate and their status in the state of Nevada in terms of abundance. And is that tracked uh, through the department or is that looked at over time in any way? I found it striking. It, uh, the article read that in Canada and the United States since 1970, the overall abundance of all avian species has been depleted by at least 30%. Thank you for the question. Um, it's a very complicated answer. I guess uh, there are a number of ongoing and long-term survey efforts, uh, the Christmas bird count, uh, the breeding bird surveys, uh, where citizen science, uh, citizen scientists are um, included in some of those efforts. And I may, I may call on Wildlife Diversity Division Administrator, uh, Ms. Newmark, to, to help answer this. So there are some species where there are certainly you know, recognized um, conservation needs. And when you look at our State Wildlife Action Plan and the 256 species that are called out in there and the 22 habitat types, a lot of, a lot of what drives the prioritization in the State Wildlife Action Plan is based on some of those uh, survey trends that have been obtained through the breeding bird surveys and the Christmas counts. Um, but when you look at the, the sheer number of species, and, and there are a significant number of bird species, migratory and otherwise, um, that exist in, in Nevada, um, that we may, may not have adequate data on. And, and that's part of the value of Recovering America's Wildlife Act, is, is it's, it's one of its primary focuses is, is to provide dedicated funding to keep common species common. And so, um, you know, this speaks to that 92% of those species um, that don't have an ability to generate revenue for the department. People aren't paying uh, to pursue them recreationally or otherwise, um, that sometimes are a little bit harder to, to track and monitor because we simply don't have the resources and the staff, thus, you know, inclusion of citizen scientists and, uh, you know, breeding bird surveys, Christmas bird counts. So the, the, the short answer is um, there certainly may be uh, decreases in Nevada that uh, are consistent with those national trends. Um, our hope is, is that by highlighting those habitats upon which those species depend and having those called out specifically in our state wildlife action plan, um, you know, we can buffer some of those, some of those impacts, some of those losses. Um, but I'll ask Jen if she would like to add to that since I, I feel eyes behind me. 
Actually, this, uh, I'm Jennifer Newmark, Wildlife Diversity Chief for the record. I don't really have a whole lot to add. Um, Director Wassley answered it perfectly. Um, one thing I can just say is um, we do, we use those long-term trends from breeding bird surveys and the Christmas bird counts to help not only set our priorities throughout the 10-year um, lifespan of the Wildlife Action Plan, but we do monitor it year from year. And one species as an example is pinion jays. We know that the, those long-term trends on pinion jays are showing declines. And so we're working right now on um, coming up with some projects to start really looking at that. We're um, hoping to partner with Great Basin Bird Observatory and some of the work that they've been doing. And so the value of having long-term trends over time cannot be overstated. And, and the reason that we know that pinion jays are um, potentially declining is because we have been monitoring them from year to year. And so a lot of what wildlife diversity does is to take time um, and look at those, uh, you know, do those annual surveys and see what our common species are, are doing. Um, and yeah, that was a, um, an important study that came out showing that 3 billion birds are missing essentially from um, 1970 to now, and it's mostly made up of the really common species. So it's not just the rare ones that are continuing to decline, but it's our finches and some of our more common species. Thank you for the question. Go ahead. Um, and on that topic, but not so much species specific, but going back more to the Recovering um, America's Wildlife Act, um, you stated that 118 um, representatives have signed on to the resolution in the House of Representatives. Um, so that would leave maybe a, almost like a 28% or 27% buy-in. Do we know what our own state legislators are doing at this point and what their position is with um, supporting this resolution? So on the, on the state side, um, our state legislature passed a resolution in support of the act. Uh, this board um, passed a resolution in support of the act. Um, our congressional delegation um, is at a very minimum um, verbally and supportive with uh, plans to sign on. And Congressman Amade was uh, original co-sponsor uh, this Congress and wasn't in the previous two Congresses. So, um, you know, I, I believe that we have significant support uh, not only by our state legislature and, and in state, um, but by our congressional delegation representing our state in, in Washington, D.C., and we'll, we'll see that grow. And of that 118, um, it's a, truly a, a bipartisan um, level of support. It is not a, a partisan issue. Conservation should not be a partisan issue, and, and fortunately, and fortunately, uh, Congress is, is not making it so. My last question just was on the Silver State Trail and that the BLM put that project once again on hold. Is that just temporarily or have they determined maybe not to move forward with that overall when we say on hold? I, I just don't know what the scope of on hold means. Yeah, thank you for the question. And admittedly, I learned that at the same time you did when I read it. Um, so I would... I would ask if there's uh, anybody here, either from White Pine County or from um, Habitat Division, I don't know if Division Administrator uh, Janae has any insight in what that means um, and when, if that's likely to change, and if so, when. I, I don't know if there's any additional perspective that somebody here could offer. Looks like he's joining us at the podium. Uh, for the record, Alan Janae, Habitat Division Chief. I am not quite sure because this is this is kind of the history of this whole project. Uh, the Silver State Trail was is that um, it goes through that process where uh, they'll pull the project. There will be no action. There will be a request from local government to you know evaluate it. It goes back into the NEPA process. And the most recent decision by the the uh, county commission to to drop it, BLM has now, you know, put that project on hold. Don't know if there will be a future request. 
you know, I don't know what the political situation is in the county as far as commission members, but there could be a turnover as has occurred in the past where they request it to be considered and it could come back. Yes, Commissioner McNooch. Thank you, Madam Chair or Vice Chair. I'm not sure which <laughs> one. I don't know what is, I am today Chair. either. <laughs> um, Tony, how many um, times can you chemically follow a burn area? I mean, is it definitely? I hope Alan didn't go too far away. He did. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to get his steps in today. Sorry about that. I actually waited until he sat back down. But So, uh, again, for the record, Alan Janae, Habitat Division Chief, chemically following is something that you can do um, repeatedly on the same piece, not, not, cons or not year after year, as typically that would be a waste of investment. But uh, the type of chemical that is used typically only goes less than half an inch into the soil. And so um, it's rather short-lived on the site. It basically uh, stops the germination of the seed. And there is another, the chemical we use is a Mazepic. It's a one year treatment, it's effective for that. It stops all seed from breaking. Um, there's another one that's coming that we're trying on limited areas called the Esplanade. It gives it a three year coverage, but again, it's a very narrow uh, soil horizon that it goes into. And you can actually put that on and then drill seed back into it. And it's very effective in allowing the drilled species to then come through because it's getting below that treatment layer. That, that's kind of where I was headed was, you know, how, how far that, how persistent it stays in the soil. I knew, I knew that they were annual, that there was a one year type of treatment, but um, that sounds promising. I mean, that, I guess there's a little bit of hope out there that maybe there's something on the horizon, but um, we talk about treating these areas and, you know, I've always looked at it from a one, one shot, one year by ourselves a year. But when you mentioned that, you know, some of these might be treated again, it's, it's, it's a pretty simple concept, but I hadn't really thought past that one year mark. So uh, that's interesting that there's something else coming that might, might even benefit even more. So. Yes, thank you, uh, Commissioner McNanch. Yeah, there's, there's some real opportunities there with some of these in looking at like fuel breaks. You know, when you can apply that for three years, um, that gives you that great opportunity for, you know, controlling fuels um, along with other tools on the landscape. But um, yeah, that would be a nice thing is, is to be able to, you know, follow it, hold it in a position. And, and again, especially when we're losing a million acres, so. Thank you. Any other questions? No? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're moving right along. Uh, litigation report. Deputy Attorney General Craig Burkett, a status report on litigation will be provided. Thank you, Vice Chair East. Uh, this will be short and sweet. Uh, so uh, we have, as you may I don't know how much you peruse these litigation updates, but uh, so there's seven pieces of litigation going on. Uh, most of them are dormant, honestly. Um, there's two updates to the litigation report I sent, uh, I, we gave you. One is uh, on item number six, which is the predator management uh, uh, case. That case is now in discovery. That's Brian Stockton's the primary handling attorney on that case. But uh, and, uh, Brian advised me this w last week that uh, that case is now uh, in discovery, which means you can start taking depositions and do, uh, requesting documents, those sorts of things. Um, so that is an update to the update we provided. The, the other one is the very last item. It's number seven, which is the the second uh, of the uh, defamation cases uh, filed by Mark Smith. Um, that one is, uh, I'm the primary handling attorney. We are moving the trial date in that case from December of uh, this year to April sometime next year to accommodate a second round of depositions that are occurring uh, and going and being scheduled presently and will be uh, conducted through the rest of 
next month and then probably through November and then we'll be done with the scheduling. And at that point, it's probably no surprise that we would continue to file a motion for some kind of guarantees. Um, so that is it. The, the one thing I noticed is that since uh, I've become an attorney for the Department of Wildlife, there's been no new lawsuits, and I want to take direct credit for that. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Any questions for our dad? Oh, okay. Uh, 20D, Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program Report, Secretary Tony Wasley, informational. The commission will hear a presentation on the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Here we go. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Uh, at, a, at a recent meeting, um, there was a request from the public to possibly consider uh, providing an informational report on the wildlife and sport fish restoration program uh, that we, we call WISIFER um, in, in, the, in the industry. So uh, I, I thought it was a great idea. The chairman uh, thought it was a great idea. Uh, it's unfortunate that we don't have uh, more public, more cabs, and more commission present, so certainly we can recycle this. Uh, very simply, it'll also be available uh, on the web page um, with the support material. So um, hopefully uh, people that have questions can, can look at this. But um, I'll share with you that as a um, you know, 20 year plus em employee of the agency, um, as a biologist, you know, I, I knew that we had federal monies coming in. I knew that it took license dollars as match to get some of those federal dollars, but I really didn't understand the program uh, that I've kind of been forced to understand um, at, at much greater depth now. And so I think there's value to the commission, there's value to the cabs, there's value to the public, there's value to employees in understanding the programs and, and how they actually work. So the mission, uh, and this is this WISIFER, uh, again, Wildlife Sport Fish Restoration Mission. It's a program that's administered by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And so these mission statements, vision statements, are uh, statements of the, the program from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. The mission, working through partnerships to conserve and manage fish and wildlife and their habitats for the use and enjoyment of current and future generations. Fairly broad. The vision healthy, diverse, and accessible fish and wildlife populations that offer recreation, economic activity, and other societal benefits in addition to sustainable ecological functions. The guiding principle, society benefits from conservation-based management of fish and wildlife and their habitats and opportunities to use and enjoy them. So about, about WISIFER, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program works with states, insular areas, and the District of Columbia to conserve, protect, and enhance fish, wildlife, their habitats, and the hunting, sport fishing, and recreational boating opportunities they provide. So when we, when we think, when we say WISIFER, and a lot of times in, in commission meetings, we throw around the, the acronym PR. So we're going to use PR, and, and PR is uh, Pittman-Robertson, I'll dive into that, but really PR, the Pittman-Robertson piece, is just the wildlife restoration piece. And we say DJ, which is the Dingle Johnson Act, which is just the sport fish restoration piece. But when we say WISIFER, it's, it's far more than just those two programs. We have 10, 10 programs. The Division of Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program provides oversight and administration, administrative support to many grant programs. And so you see the, the Wildlife Restoration Grant Program and the Sport Fish in that red rectangle there, but it also includes the Clean Vessel Act Grant Program, the Boating Infrastructure Grant Program, the National Coastal Wetlands Conservation Grant Program, state wildlife grants. Um, Nevada gets um, you know, a portion of the, the state wildlife grant uh, every year, um, largely shared between the fisheries division and diversity division. The multi-state grant program, landowner incentive grant program, 
tribal landowner um, and tribal wildlife grant programs, but really it's, it's those first two in that red rectangle that are so responsible for a significant portion of, of our budget. And so we're really gonna focus on these two main WISIFR programs today. Again, we say PR, that's the, the wildlife side, and we say DJ, that's the fish side of things. Um, together, these, these two programs have generated uh, approximately $22 billion to the nation's conservation since their inception. And the Pittman-Robertson Act was originally passed in, in 1937 and, and Dingle Johnson in, in 1950. And presently, they comprise about 45% of our agency's budget annually. Almost half of our agency's money comes from these, these, two, these two programs. So just going to take a little closer look at the wildlife restoration piece, the Pittman-Robertson Act. So what is the Pittman-Robertson Act? In the early 1900s, when many wildlife species were disappearing or declining, the firearms and ammunition industry asked Congress to impose an excise tax on the sale of firearms and ammunition to help fund wildlife conservation in the United States. So this is a industry-driven. The industry went to Congress and said, please tax us. Um, the reason why they did that was they saw a return on investment. They knew since the majority of firearms and ammunition sales at that point in time were being driven by uh, recreational pursuits. They knew that as the animals went away, that their sales would go away. So they saw a great opportunity for return on investment. If you take some money from us, if you tax us and we take that money and we use that money to reinvest in conservation uh, and we have more of those species out there that people are purchasing guns and ammo to pursue, um, that's going to help us in, in the long run. Now this has changed uh, considerably through time and, um, and I'll, I'll kind of get to that in a future slide, but when you look historically at the percentage of firearm and ammunition sales that were used by sportsmen, uh, sportsmen and women at the time this act was passed in 1937, and you compare that today, uh, today it's a much, much smaller percentage of individuals buying guns and ammo for the purposes of recreationally pursuing animals. And so it creates some challenges in the sustainability of this program. Those very same industries that went to Congress and said, please tax us, uh, some of whom now have a little bit more of an opportunity to say, wait a minute, if only, and the, and the numbers vary, but approximately, you know, mid-20s, if only 23% of our customers are purchasing guns and ammo for the purposes of, of going afield, why are we the only ones paying for conservation? And it really, it really underscores the importance of Recovering America's Wildlife Act as an additional or alternative funding model because the sustainability of an industry tax on an industry who uh, a minority of their customers are actually pursuing animals, it's a little bit different than the original intent of the act. So the resulting Pittman-Robertson Act that passed in, in 1937 uh, was named after its sponsors, Key Pittman, a Nevada senator, and Absalom Willis Robertson, a Virginia congressman. So um, there was another um, interesting uh, Nevada fact. We have a Key Pittman Wildlife Management Area, but we say PR. It's really important to remember that that P is Key Pittman, a Nevada senator. So it, it, it's an opportunity for a little Nevada pride there in, in the Pittman-Robertson Act and, and how we're actually paying for conservation. The revenue generated from these excise taxes are apportioned to the state wildlife agencies for their conservation efforts, hunter education programs, and operation of archery and shooting ranges. And when you think about the hunter education programs and you think about operation of shooting ranges, archery and shooting ranges, again, it's a return on investment to where the manufacturers who are paying these taxes uh, are supportive of a portion of this going to create opportunities for people to uh, go through hunter education because that can be a barrier to get them in the field, but also the shooting ranges because at those shooting ranges, people are purchasing ammunition. 
um, which again, they're paying federal excise tax, and it's, it's not only funding conservation, but it's, it's helping those manufacturers uh, on, in terms of their return on investment. So how does the PR Act work? The excise tax is set by law at 11% of the wholesale price for long guns and ammunition and 10% for handguns. It's paid by manufacturers, producers, and importers and applies to all commercial sales and imports, whether their purpose is hunting, sport shooting, or personal defense. And so this is, this is where um, some of those numbers through time have moved away from uh, the recreational pursuits or hunting pursuits, I'll say, and more target shooting, more handgun. They're still paying uh, that 10 percent, 11 or 10 percent tax, um, but not all of them are, are going out and in, into the field uh, hunting. And this tax, this isn't a tax that you pay when you're checking out at Bass Pro Shop. Uh, this is a tax uh, it's the wholesale tax, so you know Winchester and Federal, Remington, <clears throat> they they pay that tax uh, when they sell it to those distributors, and and presently these manufacturers are writing a check, a larger check for their federal excise tax. What they're paying in federal excise excise tax is exceeding their profits, which again creates an opportunity for them to say, what the heck, why are we the only ones paying for conservation? We're paying, we're paying more than we're making, and only 20 some odd percent of our customers are actually taking these items and, and hunting. And again, it speaks to the importance of an alternative and sustainable funding model and, and enter Recovering America's Wildlife Act. There are, there's a number of programs in place. Uh, one in particular is, is partner with a payer where states are working with industry partners with Winchester, Remington Federal and taking them out on the ground and showing them where this 10 and 11 percent of their federal excise tax is going, showing them shooting ranges, showing them habitat projects, showing them that stuff to give them a sense of pride and ownership and how their excise tax are being excise taxes are being uh, applied. And this this is also uh, uh, applies to archery equipment as well. And you look at the numbers on archery equipment and, and the number of people purchasing archery equipment and actually using it to hunt is, is uh, even smaller. The numbers there could be as low as 15, 16 percent. And so with, uh, with a number of, of movies and Hollywood, Hunger Games, and everybody uh, wanted to go buy a bow and shoot in their backyard and, and goof around, but a lot of them were target shooters. They weren't actually hunters, and so they're paying that, that excise tax, but they're not, uh, they're not hunters either, so it's even a smaller percentage of those. So those manufacturers, um, understandably, are saying, wait a minute, where's the rest of America in paying for conservation? So the tax is handled by the Department of the Treasury, which turns the funds over to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for apportionments to the states. And uh, Fish and Wildlife Service deposits the revenue into a special account called the Wildlife Restoration Trust Fund, and the funds are made available to states the year following their collection, and the funds are then distributed through this, this following process. So there's $8 million it, this is a, a fixed amount dedicated to enhanced hunter education programs, and this is nationally, uh, including the construction or maintenance of public target ranges. Three million set aside for projects that require cooperation among the, the states, and that, that was uh, one of the different uh, programs, uh, multi-state conservation grant program that was highlighted in that list of 10 programs. And then one half of the excise tax collected on handguns is set aside for basic hunter education programs. And then the remainder of the trust fund is then divided in half with 50% apportioned to states based on the land area of the state in proportion to the total land area of the country. And the remaining 50% is apportioned based on the number of individual paid hunting license holders in the state in proportion to national total. So, <clears throat> It's kind of kind of confusing, but but what it boils down to is that our Nevada's apportionment is based on our land area in proportion to the total land area in the country. So that's basically fixed percentage. Then the other half of the apportionment is based on the number of certified license holders that we have as a percentage of the total licenses in the state. And so the importance of 
every year uh, we go through a process where we have to certify our number of hunting licenses and fishing licenses. We give that to the Fish and Wildlife Service. They plug it into this formula to see where we are with national trends. So when we look at the, our trends of hunting licenses and fishing licenses and we see those increases partly due to the license simplification effort, partly due to, to Calcomine, we see these big increases. Um, we don't know how that's going to play out in the future, but at the same time, Nevada is seeing, you know, 40% increase in hunting license sales and almost 30% increase in fishing license sales. At the same time, those other states are uh, flat to declining. There's um, a likelihood that we could have uh, an increase in our apportionment. Probably wouldn't be sizable, but um, certainly better than a decrease. Uh, program funds are matched with state funds. Uh, or non-federal, 25% uh, non, non-federal or state to 75% program funds. Um, and those non-federal funds are generated through the sale of, of uh, this is hunting licenses, this says fishing, but it's actually hunting licenses. So um, <clears throat> we can use our tag and license fees are non-federal. That's where our match comes from. But we can also use in-kind match, so the whole guzzler program. Um, with all the volunteer efforts, provide 100% of the 25% of the non-federal. Um, and so it can be donated funds, it can be volunteer hours, it just can't be federal dollars. Um, so the Recovering America's Wildlife Act is set up the same way with that three to one match, but recognizing that states could have a significant challenge in generating that match, uh, for example, if Nevada were to, to get $25 million uh, to come up with that, you know, that match, one-third of that, you know, eight, eight million uh, for match would be a significant burden in one year. We don't have that kind of available match and tag and license fee. So um, what Recovering America's Wildlife Act um, contained in its, in its language was you could it didn't have to be non-federal, but it needed to be non-Department of Interior, non-Department of Ag. So you could use uh, Department of Energy or EPA or Department of Defense funds as part of that match to, to lessen that burden for the states. So essentially, uh, our budget, <clears throat> uh, you know, 95 percent or so, uh, is being generated. Half, half of that comes from tag and license fees, and half of that is is coming from our federal, our two federal uh, aid programs, mostly through those two federal aid programs. Uh, what types of projects are funded? So states use their PR funds to restore, manage, and enhance wild birds and mammals and their habitat. PR projects also include providing public access to wildlife resources, hunter education, and the development and management of shooting ranges. Additionally, funds contribute to the hunter education programs and support construction and operation of shooting ranges for the reasons that we already talked about, the return on investment. Uh, now that the restoration is complete for many of the hunted species, so it was really white-tailed deer, turkey, um, you know, at, at, at back in the 1930s that were the, the most commonly pursued species and the species that were in greatest conservation need. And so now that the restoration of a lot of those uh, species that had, you know, great popularity back in the Midwest and the East, the, the emphasis has shifted to active management, applied wildlife research, and ensuring a, a public access. So current PR funding priorities include acquiring land for public use, operating and managing wildlife management areas, conducting research projects that address specific needs and providing technical guidance to landowners to meet their wildlife management objectives. So <clears throat> pretty unique in Nevada, 85, 86, whatever the percent of public lands, but uh, turn the tables in a state like Texas where there are over 90% private lands. And so it's incumbent upon the state wildlife agency to work really well with those private landowners. And you create herd management plans for each of those private landowners. And if you can offset those costs <clears throat> with federal dollars, wildlife's going to be better off, the state's going to be better off. <clears throat> so why is PR so effective? A key reason for the success was the inclusion of the wording in the original 1937 law that prohibits the diversion of license fees paid by hunters for any other purpose than the administration of state wildlife agencies. So a state wildlife agency, I mean, I, we as a Nevada Department of Wildlife and a state wildlife agency are, are um, 
the envy of a lot of other state agencies because of our funding model. We don't go to our state legislature and grovel for general fund dollars. We have a, uh, on, the, on the PR and DJ side, we have a fairly uh, predictable funding model. Um, we, we've gone from 1% as an agency, our budget was 1% general fund uh, two sessions ago. We increased to 2% general fund. In this last session, we increased to 3% general fund. Most of those general fund dollars are, are being used to match um, for our diversity program to get those state wildlife grants to manage those, those, a lot of those diversity species. And it's also the general fund dollars are also being used to offset the agency's cost and the urban wildlife arena um, and more appropriate uh, source of that, that, that funding. Um, but diversion requires that our tag and license fees remain under the control of the state wildlife agency. Um, so all that federal aid, uh, all those tag and license fees, any money uh, that's coming into the department or provided to the department through this federal aid by law must remain under the control of the department. So state legislatures can't take the tens of millions of dollars from a state wildlife agency and use it to balance the budget, or they can't take it from wildlife and put it in you know, water resources or you know whatever whatever else. But if we as an agency decide that that's the best use of that money, um, we, we can apply it there or work in partnership with, with some of those other folks, but it's, it's protected. And so that's really, really key piece of that language. So when you hear us say diversion, um, it's that our tag and license revenue or our federal aid uh, could potentially be diverted off to another purpose um, not directly related to this and outside the control of the agency. Uh, the user pay public benefit model is extremely successful because our sportsmen and women and the industries that serve them have always been willing to commit the resources necessary to protect, enhance, and expand conservation, hunting, and shooting heritage. Sport fish restoration, very similar. Um, <clears throat> involves the cooperative efforts of state and federal wildlife agencies, the fishing tackle industry, anglers, and boaters. Uh, what started as an excise tax on rods, reels, and creels, and fishing lures used to help fund U.S. efforts during World War II was redirected in 1950 thanks to the efforts of uh, outdoor enthusiast Congressman John Dingell of Michigan and Senator Edwin Johnson of Colorado. Excise taxes are placed on fishing tackle, such as rods, reels, lines, hooks, sinkers, all types of artificial lures, electric motors, import duties on boats, sailboats, and yachts, and a motorboat fuel tax on gasoline are collected and placed in a trust fund in the Department of Treasury in D.C. The purpose, uh, restoration and management of fish species of material uh, value for um, sport fishing and recreation, to provide facilities that create or add to the public access for recreational boating, and provide aquatic education to public to increase understanding of water resources and associated aquatic life. The source of the funds, excise tax, again, on sport fishing equipment, electric motors, sonar, uh, import duties, and, and the portion of the gas tax, and then the interest earned on that. So in, in fiscal year 2019, uh, $370 million apportioned um, in the last fiscal year alone. Again, that's, that's nationally. So the, the Sport Fish Restoration Program provides grant funds to states, D.C., again, insular areas, uh, fisheries projects, boating access, and aquatic education, authorized uh, by the Dingle Johnson Act, D.J. of 1950. It was created to restore, better manage America's declining fishery resources and was modeled after uh, the Pittman-Robertson Act. And so through the purchase of fishing equipment, motorboat, small engine fuels, duties. Uh, the SFR program is one of the most successful user pay, user, user benefit um, programs. How are these distributed? Um, somewhat similar, uh, but they're distributed to states for the, for the programs funded, collected in an account known as a sport fish restoration account, one of two accounts in the Aquatic Resources Trust Fund established under the authority of, of the Internal Revenue Code and the distribution formula is based on 40% of a state's size in square miles 
including land and both inland and coastal waters in proportion to other states, and 60% on annual license sales. So instead of 50-50 on the wildlife side, it's 40-60, with more emphasis being placed on annual license sales in proportion to other states. So you can imagine the driest state in the country it's, can be a little bit difficult to compete with states like Florida. Uh, they're surrounded by water, uh, a whole lot more fishing opportunity. Uh, but it's still uh, significant to our, our fisheries uh, program, bringing in you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of $5 million a year. Program funds, just like the uh, wildlife side, 25% uh, non-federal, 75% program. Um, non-federal uh, coming from sale, license sales, donations in kind. And the program requires funds be spent on sport fishing and boating related activities. So that's kind of the uh, 30,000 foot overview. Um, it gets far more complicated when you're trying to identify the match, the appropriate match, come up with dollar values for the in-kind match, volunteer time, travel, all that. But suffice it to say, it's an incredibly uh, important program for our agency, generating almost half uh, of our, our budget. One, one last thing that I, I just like to point out, oftentimes, um, you know, we'll hear that, um, you know, who, who pays uh, for, for conservation? And, and some folks will say, well, you know, only 23% of the people actually paying this excise tax through the purchase of guns and, and ammo are actually using it to hunt. You know, I, I pay that tax too and I don't hunt, therefore I should, you know, um, I should get equal credit or have equal say. And um, <clears throat> that's certainly a, a debate um, that has grown. But I'll point out the only way that the state gets access is through the, that license certification, through the number of hunting and fishing licenses. So even though um, there are other people that are paying those federal excise taxes on both the fishing and, well, on both the archery and uh, guns and ammo side, the only way a state wildlife agency gets access to those dollars is by the certified uh, license sales. Um, and so it's the number of, of hunting licenses that we sell that dictates um, how much of that uh, money that, that we're getting. So as those license sales go up and down, uh, the amount available goes up and down. I'm sorry, I already said one last point. One final last point. When we look at the amount of those federal excise taxes that are being generated, it varies quite a bit through time. And during the uh, Obama administration, the fear, the Second Amendment uh, infringement fears really drove guns and ammo sales. And so, um, you know, the economy tanked, uh, you know, real estate prices, uh, you know, were, were a huge problem. And everybody ran to Cabela's and everywhere else and, and bought all the guns and ammo they could. And so our federal excise tax was going through the roof. And while everybody else was, you know, slowly bleeding to death and, and the economy uh, was in the tank, we had what we called the Obama bump. Um, <clears throat> where we had more money than we had capacity to spend it. We saw that continually grow. With the change in pre presidential administration and some of the fears around Second Amendment um, infringement declining, uh, guns and ammo sales have flattened off a little bit. And so um, we actually saw some correction. We saw a little bit of, of decrease in those available dollars. Um, so that it does vary a little bit through time and, and the, who ends up in the, in the White House has some effect on the public perception around their, their Second Amendment rights and that can really drive guns and ammo sales up or down and, and that has a, an effect on our bottom line. Thanks, Tony. Um, I have one quick question then I'll open it up. What about the optics side? Do we get any funding from any of the ancillary you we know, we do items. not. That's a really good question. That model has been considered quite a bit. Um, there was a big effort called Teaming with Wildlife that proposed an equipment tax. Mm -hmm. uh, this was back in the mid 90s, late 90s, and it, it proposed kind of a to use the PRDJ model on outdoor equipment, backpacks, uh, mm -hmm. binoculars, so that the the birding community, the the outdoor recreation community more broadly could help support conservation for the things that, that they enjoyed. And um, I think there was really only one big industry proponent 
uh, at the time, and that was Johnny Morris, uh, CEO, founder of Bass Pro Shops. He was a big, big proponent of that model, uh, but ultimately it <clears throat> kind of crashed and burned, and that was a, a model that was again uh, reconsidered with Recovering America's Wildlife Act when they were looking at, at potential models. Um, but because of, of the experiences with teaming with wildlife, they decided to go away from uh, a tax. I mean, tax is a, is a, is a bad word, and, and uh, industry, you know, really competitive, didn't, didn't like it. So presently, there, there is no uh, mechanism to, to get uh, tax from a lot of that other outdoor equipment. And you answered my other questions. I, I had a question about the apportionment, but you answered that, so I'm good. Anybody else have questions? Commissioner Keel? Yeah, thank you. Um, what happens in the event that there's unused PR or DJ money in a given year? How is that re then reallocated back to the state? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so that's a really good question. A portion of it, and I don't recall, um, it's not that I don't recall, I don't even know how much of it, but the North American Wetland Conservation Act, NACA, uh, part of what funds um, a portion of NACA is, uh, I, I believe it's unused uh, PR so that there, if, if money, it's called re reverted. If you don't spend all that you have available, you revert it back. It goes back into the account into that trust fund that's administered by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and those reverted dollars um, I believe a portion of them may stay for uh, use in subsequent years. Um, don't quote me on that, but I, I also believe a portion of those go to other conservation programs, and I believe the North American Wetland Conservation Act is a beneficiary of some of those reverted dollars, where some of those reverted PR dollars can then be made available to NACA. Perspective that go away. Any other questions? Commissioner Hubs? One of the things that stuck out to me at the very beginning was the excise tax and the purchase of ammunition and uh, weapons. Um, you were saying that the excise tax is more than they're making when they're selling them to the retail outlets. I mean, that wouldn't make sense from a business perspective, it's, so I don't it's understand. More, from their, more than their profit. They're writing a bigger check in federal excise tax than they're taking home. It, it's, it's included in part, as part of their cost of production, but the check that they're writing for federal excise tax is, in, in many instances, exceeds what their profit margin is. Oh, I understood the profit margin yeah. of it. Okay, that, that makes sense. Other questions? No? Thank you. Anything to add? No? You're good? Okay. Um, we'll move on to... Agenda item number 21, future commission meetings and commission committee assignments. Secretary Tony Wasley and Chairman Johnston for possible action. The next commission meeting is scheduled for November 1 and 2, 2019 in Reno. The commission will review and discuss potential agenda items for that meeting. The commission may change the time and meeting location at this time. The chairman may designate and adjust committee assignments as necessary at this meeting. Do you have anything to? I do. Thank you. Okay. Um, so as, as you indicated, the next meeting will be November 1st and 2nd in Reno at the Washoe County Commission Chambers. Uh, we'll video stream on YouTube and teleconference to Vegas. Uh, we'll be looking for recommendations for the Conservation Partner Spotlight item. Okay. So if any, uh, any commissioners have any ideas on who you might like to uh, offer an invitation to to, to hear from, um, please share that. We have a few, a few action items. Uh, taking raptors for uh, falconry seasons and those quotas, that, that's a, amended in odd number years, uh, set in even numbered years. So we are in 2019, so I, I don't know if there are any amendments um, coming forward there, that's a possibility. And then the uh, non-commercial collection seasons and limits for live unprotected reptiles and amphibians, again, that's amended in odd number of years. Um, I don't know if there's any amendments there. Those are possible uh, action items. We have uh, multiple CGRs, uh, our third workshop on CGR 487, the tag transference deference return. Um, 
We'll have a second workshop on Friday with possible adoption Saturday for the CGR 487, the live bait fish and tackle restrictions. It didn't seem like um, there were any, any substantial changes there that would preclude us from doing a second workshop on Friday and possibly an adoption Saturday, but we can work with the, with the chair on that. Um, and then we have three possible adoptions, uh, CGR 486, the veteran waterfowl, which is an amendment to NAC that would just create uh, authority in NAC for the commission if you choose to uh, create that hunt during the March uh, waterfowl season uh, setting process. Wouldn't, wouldn't require that to, to be the outcome, but would provide you the authority to do so if, if you chose to. Uh, CGR 488, the landowner comp uh, regulation, uh, also up for adoption, and then CGR 489, the, the shed antler one as well. Um, I don't have any um, committees on, on my schedule that'll be meeting, but certainly we can uh, work with Chairman Johnston uh, to confirm that, that he didn't have any uh, committees that, that he anticipated meeting. And then uh, we'll have a few reports. We'll have a report on the predation management uh, status report, uh, wildlife trust fund report, and then as requested yesterday, an update on the Fallon, the FRTC uh, update also. And then uh, there was, um, I mentioned that I'd like to uh, possibly share that 14 minute video on the uh, wildlife overpasses um, in Nevada. It's uh, Reconnecting Wild is, is the title on that. Um, and lastly, there was a, a desire to have a uh, CAB budget workshop luncheon. And so we'll also um, work with the, the chair and see if, if that is a, an item that uh, he feels can be accommodated during that and, and certainly work uh, with Mr. Yannick to see if that uh, fits with his schedule. We were gonna try to tap his expertise to assist us with the, with the budget workshop for the cabs. And I think that concludes what I have on my list for possible agenda items at that November Reno meeting. Okay, sounds like a good one. Uh, moving on to public comment period. Um, do we have any public comment? Oh, I guess I need to read this. Persons wishing to speak are requested to complete a speaker's card and present it to the recording secretary. Public comment will be limited to three minutes. No action can be taken by the commission at this time. Any item requiring commission action may be scheduled on a future commission agenda. Do we have any public comment in Reno? Yes. Chairman, we have comment in Reno. Please stand by. Thank you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Hello, uh, this is Terry Kalo, Washoe County resident. And I wanted to uh, thank the uh, Nevada Department of Wildlife for working on wildlife crossing uh, to keep wildlife safe. Uh, thank you to Commissioner Hubs for addressing the significant bird losses that recently have been publicized by EDF. I also want to recognize uh, California and Arizona. California for fur trapping ban and Arizona for the killing contest ban. Uh, these states are certainly recognizing what true conservation is. In Nevada, we still have a 96 hour trap visit and that is not conservation, not heritage. It is strictly trap for convenience. Sportsmen have garnered wildlife ideas and partnerships from many other states, even California. Uh, hopefully, Nevada can take some direction from these two states. And lastly, I would like to thank you for having this opportunity for video streaming, and thank you to Katie for being here all day yesterday and part of today. Thank you. Any other no. public comment in Reno? No more comment in Reno, thank you. Thank you, public comment in Las Vegas. My name is Stephanie Myers, I live in Las Vegas. 
The California legislature took an amazing and bold step at the beginning of this month. The Wildlife Protection Act of 2019 was signed into law. It prohibits trapping of native animals, including bobcats, gray foxes, coyotes, beavers, badgers, and mink, plus the selling of their pelts. It prohibits commercial or recreational trapping on both public and private lands. Although commercial trapping was an early part of California's and Nevada's economy, now, because of the small number of active trappers, California determined that it could not afford to pay the full cost of implementing and regulating the trapping industry as required by law. Is Nevada any different? Is managing the trapping industry in Nevada too costly? Should Nevada prioritize animal watching over animal cruelty? Under the new law, using traps in California to catch rodents would still be permitted. The practice of trapping, killing, and skinning bobcats and other wildlife to supply fur markets in China and Russia is a non-essential and cruel practice. Trappers are anachronistic, and their traps and snares subject wildlife to horrific suffering. I would challenge the Nevada Board of Wildlife Commissioners to consider this law for Nevada before the people demand it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ms. Myers. Um, any other public comment? Yes, good morning for the record, Fred Volz. And I'd like to mention that a truly astounding development has been completely overlooked amidst the informational reports of the last two days. Just over two weeks ago, the state of Arizona took the forward thinking step of banning wildlife killing contests for cash and prizes. New Mexico, California, Colorado, Maryland, and Vermont have all seen the wisdom of limiting wildlife killing contests on some basis. However, Arizona has now approved the most comprehensive policy to address this long festering and pointless carnage on a unanimous vote. Nevada's approach toward wildlife killing contests remains mired in an archaic past. While both Governors Sisolak and Sandoval have attempted to join the 21st century economy by incenting high-tech industries to locate here. Despite the complete absence of any sound science to support wildlife killing contests, a majority of Nevada's wildlife commissioners has twice refused to end or even diminish these regressive contests even after citizen petitions and extensive public testimony were presented. The contests generate bad optics for a hunting community that faces declining demographics. The negative state image that such contests present parallels already prohibited dogfighting and cockfighting. It was stated by Commissioner East just yesterday that one of the commission's tasks is to, and I'll quote, to protect and conserve the state's wildlife, unquote but it is impossible to protect and conserve wildlife species or the all-important interspecies food chain by indiscriminately and massively destroying any species of wildlife. The current Nevada Wildlife Commission and Department of Wildlife need to educate themselves on what a neighboring state has done to help its wildlife, then implement a similar plan using Arizona's template if it is genuinely concerned with helping our wildlife species, not just setting them up for death. Hopefully, someone in both entities will demonstrate leadership and pursue this issue so Nevada can be a relevant participant in a 21st century world rather than an, ir an irrelevant 19th century one. And I would ask that my comments be added verbatim to the meeting record. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Volz. Any other public comment? Seeing none. Um, we will be adjourned until our next meeting in November, and our thoughts are with uh, Chairman Johnston. Thanks.